It should come as no surprise that a superstar, somebody, you know, who is is, is awarded and revered and creative as Dave, would just walk on in the room like that and just, just like, what's up, everybody? Just casually. Just yeah. casually. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it's nothing. I was, yeah. I didn't get to go in and do my usual kind of more elaborate greeting in the dressing room. and. Oh, that's okay. I like it. <laughs> yeah, he said when I do that. He's like, no, 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 please, anything but that. I like the way it's worked out. <laughs> Congratulations on the whole damn thing. Oh, yeah. This is a vision, Thanks, man, that you've had, I don't even know for how long. You tell us, but you saw it through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I don't know how, yeah, you know, my whole life I always wanted to jump to being a comedian for sure. So the, the TV show uh, in itself was always a dream come true. And of course, along the way, I really became, you know, fully in love with music and being a rapper. And when you make the show, it takes up so much of your time that it's hard to even create music in between. So I'm happy... You know, but obviously the show is about a rapper, so there needs to be music on the show. And then I'm always like in between the show making music in every single moment. It's kind of risky, and I'll tell you why I think it's kind of risky is because we knew you as a music, as a as a musician and an artist, yeah. And we also knew that you love to be to put the visuals around that, and it really mm -hmm. helped because you're very good at it. But then bringing it into a TV show environment and making your music such an essential part of that plot. What if you didn't get past season one? You know, it's right. like it could have backfired in multiple ways. Yeah, yeah, you're not wrong. I uh, I guess I've always kind of just bet on myself and. I try not to think about the worst case scenario. I really try to imagine the best case. What's that like? <laughs> <laughs> Are you a worst case scenario That's kind of guy? I kind of have been my whole life. Oh. I'm trying to get there. How do you know when you've been renewed? I've never asked that to anybody because I can imagine you do season one and you're like, I did my job, but there's so much that kind of goes into making sure that people see it, right? It's like when you release a song, you can be so happy with the result when you leave the studio, but then if no one listens to it, it's not often the artist's responsibility. Right. So how do you how do you know when it's like, hey, good news, we're going around again and we're going around again and we're going around again? You know, you're in constant dialogue with the network and in my situation, the show like right from the jump, like really succeeded immediately. I got really... Uh, I think I was one of the few people who honestly like benefited from the pandemic in the sense that right when the pandemic hit, my show came out and it was like nobody could go anywhere. And the only thing to watch on TV that was new was my show. So like it was like, wow, like what a, you know, and then so immediately it kind of took off in this huge way. And I've been fortunate in that regard. There's an element of truth to that, but but I, I don't think you're giving the show. and, and Well, yes, I agree. Know, it's the show's great. I love the show. And <laughs> yeah, I, I, the show. I think I think in any in any environment it would have took off. But, you know, it, I. It was, it's like kind of similar to my music career in a way that I hadn't put anything out and people thought I was crazy for even like be, trying to become a rapper. And then the first day I put it out, it really went super viral day one. And like, I feel like every kind of, unfortunately for me, every time I've like had the moment where it's like the morning of like releasing this big thing that I've worked, whether it's like my first music, Freaky Friday or the show, it just took off right away in a way that like is a huge relief to your soul when you're like what's going to happen i want to talk about that relief bit because i think that there's so much confidence attached to the lack of confidence in dave the character yeah it's this beautiful combination of yeah. the two but i wonder when you're about to release music for the first time when you've made that that move from infrastructure from the idea of working in the creative industries whether it's advertising or whatever mm -hmm. and like i'm going to bet on myself i got to put this music out now i'm going to find out once and for all whether Anyone likes this? Do people like it because it's funny? Do people like it because it's funny and they think I'm talented? Right. There's so many questions there going are, around. Yeah. Were you feeling that anxiety? Mm, not really. I, I Honestly, at, at that phase, I'm so desperate. Like, you know what I mean? Where it's like, when it's so unproven, I'm just like, I don't even consider the downside of people not connecting with it. I'm just so like intensely desperate on it working that really that's all I'm thinking about is like imagining it working. But are you a guy that cares what people think about what you do when you on the day you finish it? You know, I wish I wasn't. I, I, I totally wish that I could like, and, and, and to an extent, like if I make something that I'm super proud of, like, and it's not necessarily received the same way, uh, I can live with it, but I do care what people think. Yeah. I wish I didn't, but to be quite honest, yeah, of course, you know, I feel like, my whole career has kind of started, you know, even trying to, the concept of a, a comedian, I think most comedians probably begin as like people that love making people laugh because they just want to be liked. And it's like a way to connect with human beings. So so how do you find success changes you and do you like what it changes you into? Like say when the, when the show becomes a success and people start to really talk about you in, in that regard, like they talk about you in the same breath as like what Larry David has achieved or be at an early stage in your career and you're yeah. working with the same people who work on him. You know, I, I've seen success change people and I've seen them come through the other side of that and go, I don't want to take too much of that 
sort of guess with me. Yeah, I don't think success has changed me at all. I really feel like I haven't even changed since I've been like 12 years old. Who are you kidding? This <laughs> guy? Are you kidding me? This guy? Yeah. He's kidding me. Yeah. This guy's kidding me. Look, he's changed so much. Yeah, he smells great. You see what he drove into? Yeah. It's amazing, man. The guy's got a Maybach out there. I mean, no, I life. got dropped off at an Uber and they didn't even turn into the parking lot. I had to, get out. I had to walk <laughs> by foot. Penith is the name of the album. It is a combination of the of you know a majority of the music that you've used throughout the entire series, yeah. but in full because a lot of the times we didn't hear these songs in full. Exactly, it's like you know the, the the overlying theme of this album is every song that exists on it has been in the show in some way, shape, or form. And you know sometimes when it's on the show, like it could be like one of my favorite songs, and you only hear it for like ten seconds. But the crazy thing about that, if we can get in the order of that, is people think that pieces of music are made for the show and not made and then used on the show, especially when they're made for a certain scene. Yeah. So in my mind, even even though I know that you, you write music and make albums, I'm watching that scene thinking, oh, he just did that 36 bars for, for the that show. scene. I don't re didn't realize you've been making entire songs as you've been going. I make the songs kind of independent of the show. There are times where like, you know, a scene needs a very particular need. Um, but most of the time, I really am just like in between seasons, like I get like a little bit of time and I'm just like making music, not even just like just to make music because I like love making music. And then it's time to make the show again. And I'm like, what do I have in my pile that can work? Um, which is, you know, at least, at least, at least when I'm working hard in the off season, the fruit of my labor can then be used in the show. What's really cool about this show, um, aside from the creative side of it, it's funny, it's really well written, the acting's great, the cameos are great, um, is that actually as the show evolved, the the narrative that you were on presented itself, and I feel like it was never a guarantee. I feel like Drake was never guaranteed to show up at the end, even though he was a through line yeah. in your in your life story. Yeah. No. Am I, I wrong, or was that something you were kind of wishfully thinking about as you were writing it? Oh, such wishful thinking! Like especially with this season finale that we just did. Like we wrote an entire episode, like based on Brad Pitt showing up and being the main character of the episode. But you didn't have Brad Pitt. I booked. had never met Brad Pitt. I didn't know, and all I heard. <laughs> All have I you heard... seen that episode? It's one of the best episodes the of one, television. No, you gotta watch it. You gotta watch it. I gotta open to it. I gotta no, open it's, to go. the auto yeah. it's super dark. The Brad Pitt auto tune scene is like my dream come true. And like, truly, like, we're in the writer's room and I'm like, you know, thinking about the finale and all of my writers are looking at me like, but you don't even know Brad Pitt. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, I'm like, yeah. I know. I just have, like, I heard through the grapevine that he was a fan of the show. So, who do you hear that through the grapevine from? I heard it from my friend Ben, who I think took a meeting at his production company, Plan B. And they were at Brad's production company. And, like, I think in the meeting, someone who he was talking to was like, oh, yeah, because Ben directs some episodes on my show. And he was like, Brad loves Dave. And wow. then Ben hit me. He was like, Brad. And that was like years ago. And who knows how true or not true that is. But it's a little something. So, at least with Drake, I, like, was, you know, at a bar one night and, like, I turned around and Drake was right there and he was like, you're exactly who I can't wait to talk to. And he like praised me and like told me how much he loved Beautiful. the show. At least I had evidence in front of me. That being said, even Drake, I was like, who knows what his schedule will be. And like, I even wrote like the whole season ended. And he's good at a very charming no. Drake says no in a way that makes you feel like he still might take you out for a steak dinner one night. All I know is that I couldn't have, it was so risky and like it's kind of like I said, I kind of bet on myself and I was rewarded. I, I, when when I, I didn't believe, even when Brad Pitt and his agents and everything was booked, I was like, I literally couldn't believe it until I saw him in like HD right in front of so me. So can we just really? <laughs> super nerd out on the Brad Pitt episode Please. because I can't remember the last time if ever I've spoken to anyone who's worked closely with Brad Pitt on anything let alone in something that is a real out of character experience for one of the great character actors. So, can we talk a little bit about like what that was like when he showed up on set, what the initial conversation was like? So, first off, unfortunately, the first time he came to set, I was filming this scene where, you know, the episode is built around me and a stalker and like I was filming the scene where she was like making a cast mold of my like lower body. So, like which sucks to because basically when I when Brad they're like Brad's here and I'm literally naked covered in like Isn't sludge. Isn't this why he's here though? <laughs> And then I had to like be like, okay. And then like I have to like, I'm f like, I have to walk out like truly like naked with like clay covering my body and be like, hey, Brad, like, <laughs> oh my God. And he said, he looked at you and you're exactly who I've been waiting to yeah. talk to. It was, it was honestly a nice icebreaker. You know what I mean? At least there was like immediate talking points. And then he was, talk about, I have never seen, first off, the guy is an absolute dream. Like the coolest guy I've ever met in my life, no question. And, you know, on set, we have such a great crew and cast, and every day we definitely, like, work as hard as we can to make the best possible product. There is such a marked difference. Like, when Brad Pitt is there, like, everyone's posture is, like, <laughs> fully upright, and, like, you can just tell that, like, everyone goes into work on the days where he's there being, like, we're at the top of our game. Like, that guy treats, like, every single person yeah. the exact same. He's yeah. such a, he was, like, 
big upping like the light people. Like, you know, he's like so good at like making and he doesn't do it in a way that feels like he's just doing this just to do it. No, he really is that like sweet and, and nice and cool. And it, so how it, do you keep your composure when you're in a scene with Brad Pitt? Because I know you can act, but you're acting opposite somebody who's now one of the iconic actors of his in any other generation. I know. And he gets to play a role that's very out of character for him. That's why he wants to do it. Yeah. He gets to be Brad Pitt out of being Brad Pitt. Yeah. But you still have to be Dave. Very surreal. Like there are like, you know, it's I, and I'm sitting there and I'm giving him notes and like, you know, and he's like responding to them really well and like respecting what I'm saying. And like, you know, he's worked with the people I aspire to be like one day. Like he's worked with every one of the best directors of all time. And like, I think he really like looked at me and respected me as a filmmaker. And I, I think it has to be the most validating moment of my life so far, because this guy really is like the movie star of not just like my generation, but like. I feel like the past like 40 years, he's been like the guy and to work with him and to like, there are moments where I'm like making him laugh so hard that he has to like compose himself. And then they'll be like, oh, okay, okay, okay. Like, like, and just to like be in. What was your favorite moment of the day? One singular thing that happened on or off camera during that moment, during that, 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 that. Film? When I go, I just like, there was a moment where I like, I, you know, we do a lot of like rewriting and writing right there in the spot on the day. And there was just a, a, a thing that required some jokes from Brad. And I just went into where he was sitting in his like green room. And I just sat down on the floor Indian style. And I was going to just pitched him jokes on like what. And then it ended up just turning into a conversation about like his career and my career. And just like having that one on one time of just like sitting and talking with him and him being like so interested in me. Of course, I'm interested in him, but it's just incredible. Wow, man, what a ride. And then the auto tune. Oh, the auto tune like, was outrageous. Let me, that, that, that was the coolest part. Because like, first off, like he was like, I don't think he like, he's obviously never heard himself sing an auto tune. And then he was like, so what are we doing? And then I made like, I tried to make like a little demo, like, so he could like see it. And then I was like, just trust me. Like, cause he's like, I can't sing. And I'm like, Brad, like you don't need that's to be the a point. Yeah. That's the, like, <laughs> I'm telling you, you go like, and it will sound perfect. And then he went in there and he really like the joy that he felt experiencing auto tune for the first time <laughs> was palpable. And then I even had, I was in his ear and able to be like, you know, I was like, singing like a bar a, a bar ahead and I was like don't do this and then he would be like don't do this and it was like so it was like the voice of God being like in it it was so cool if you haven't seen this episode and you're listening to this live right now it is along with the whole series but it is one of the th you know every series needs a couple of standout episodes you, you just do I mean it could yeah. be a great ride the whole way through and there'll be a couple that people are like Ross and leather pants. You know what I mean? Like yeah. that's funny. Yeah. And this was one of the great episodes I think of the whole the whole ride. Oh my God. It's like a, first off, it's like an hour. It's like it's, a, know, it's a it's, long episode. And shouts to the stalker too, who, I mean, she's held her own. Tanae, she's unbelievable. unbelievable. She, she, honestly, she stole the show. Yeah. She really stole the show and yeah. Brad Pitt was in the show and like me too. And she like killed it. Like, I think there's no one else in the world that could have played that part but her. Like she's so, you have to be so unbelievably funny and then so unbelievably like emotionally dark too to be able to like pull that off. And she like killed it in every capacity. Yeah, I was, my emotions were flipping between laughing and literally covering my eyes. Yeah. Like I was like, oh, this is almost a horror episode. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was like a psychological thriller comedy. Yeah, that's the power of, you know, somebody who has a great charisma and, you know, what they call star appeal, but also incredible actor, like incredible. Yeah. The ability to be able to lean into that role and know that it's going to have an effect on people and be unafraid to do that. She is another person that I grew up idolizing who like being able to work with and it's total dream come true and she is also just as wonderful as you'd ever dream of like she's a, just a great person well you can tell because she, you know we were talking about that run in the, in the sort of beginning of Rachel from Mean Girls all the way through Regina George man yeah Johnny. Johnny. But, but then you know you go in a notebook and then you go in like wedding, wedding crashes, crashes and all yeah. these star yeah. turns that she did where she just owned the movie got the Marvel true detective, money true detective season but, no, but, 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 but oh, you're gonna bring it up but, well, but, no, but, but I, I, there's a space there's a space between those things yeah in the first 1.0 you felt like she could just keep this rocket ship going yeah and just going and going and going and she did that thing where she was like mm, let me take some from what I could tell let me yeah, pull back let me take some control yeah no, I, working with her, total dream come true. It's like surreal again to be like, you know, you're a boy and you're like, this is like, you know, everyone grows up with like the idea of like a celebrity crush. She was always that. And it's like to be able to then be able to like recreate all that type of thing in a show when she's like one of the more iconic movie stars of my time again, coming to do television, which she just doesn't do. It really speaks to, and, and all these people are doing it now because I didn't know her. None, none of them know me. Is it a similar situation to Brad? You heard that she liked the show? Yeah. And, and it's just, it's, wow. you know, season one, I'm like, 
telling YG, like, trust me, like, this show is going to be good. And, like, you know, people haven't yeah, seen yeah, it, yeah, and yeah. you never know. By season three, like, all the biggest movie stars and musicians are like, it's my favorite show. And I'm just like, amazing. Like, let's make it. Who else did that that wasn't on the show? Let's flex for a bit. I have DMs with LeBron where we're just talking about how much he loves the show. And it's like, I literally just met LeBron on the shop, and... I can't believe it. I'm like looking at LeBron James and he's talking to me like in reality about like my art and being like, it's so funny and great. And I, it's like, you know, I, I, I obviously like love making art for all the fans out there to connect with, of course, but there's something about your idols, like loving what you're doing. That really is like the ultimate validation. Now I, I know that we shouldn't live life for validation and I'm trying to get, get out of that loop where it's like, everything is all about validation. Validation is fine, man. Yeah. A little, it's, it's from LeBron and Brad Pitt and then it's okay. <laughs> what, what, is, <laughs> what is the point in, in admiring people, letting them inspire you to want to be a part of this whole experience if you can't get close to them and appreciate it when they give it back. Totally. I just would, you know, like, what if LeBron and Brad Pitt never happened? And then, like, would I be, like, sitting at home being like, oh, like, when will LeBron acknowledge me? That's, like, not the right way to live life. So, like, even though the coin has flipped right in this particular instance for me, it's a dangerous, like, game to play uh, moving forward. That being said, of course, I believe in the product I'm going to make, and I, I imagine people will like it, but... You know, I'm just trying to, I just know the dangers of like living your life based, like tying your identity to your art and how your art is received by like the biggest stars in the world. It's not the right way to live life. So when did you play Rachel McAdams, Mr. McAdams? And and, and were you On there set. when she heard it? Yeah. What, what, did you, what was her reaction? She's cracking up. Cracking up. She's amazing. And that's one of the cool things that came across all the people that are on the show from her to, to Brad to all the cameos, even Drake, you know, they all have a history of laughing at themselves. They yeah. all have the ability. I know people say about Drake right now, he's not doing that. But he's not laughing at a certain type of dialogue or narrative. He's not into that narrative. He doesn't like passive aggressive sh that goes on around him. But if you get him in a situation where you get him face to face and you and you give him the material, he will laugh at himself. For I sure. gotta say, Drake, like that scene that we shot had to be like short because it was like the end of the you know the season. And I couldn't, but like the footage I have of me and him talking, like it could have been like he is so funny. Like I to I told him like of course he's like the best rapper of of my life. You know what I mean? But like what I didn't like know was that he's like truly a top five comedic actor and like i don't like i have so much footage of me and drake where i like can't even like he's making me hysterically laugh he's so funny like one of the funniest like on-screen talents like in the world yeah well he's got a comedian's face and that he can keep it very straight and no, carry man, a line and he can also keep go super goofy it, it is hard to break him like i break a lot of people like where i'm you know being funny like he is stone-faced and he can really like do it but he still understands what i'm doing it's not like above his head like he gets what i'm doing he really was blew me away as an actor i told him I was like editing the scene and it was like, I was like, it sucks that this can't even be 10 minutes. Like, I wish we could make like a 15 minute scene of just We've me all and been you saying that ever since we've seen him doing skits or things, whether it's on SNL or doing other little bits and bobs or stuff on YouTube, the stuff he did with Will Ferrell. I mean, all oh, that yeah. stuff is so oh, brilliant. Yeah. And we were, you know, we've all been saying behind the scenes in the same way we'd all kind of say very quietly behind the scenes about, God, wouldn't it be great if Taylor went to the middle of nowhere and made a songwriter record? And then she made two of the best of all time. But even all fans, I mean, kind of willing Drake in the same breath to like, hey, you know, when you're not out there breaking records as the world, greatest rapper alive why don't you uh you know get back into comedy you know yeah he's i mean he can he can do whatever he wants in the future you know and it's i don't blame him for riding the spaceship that is like the most iconic musical career like borderline ever so it's tough to find time you know a cameo that got me too because we're talking about people that have traditionally laughed at themselves and someone who took themselves takes themselves very serious and they should how did you get kareem abdul jabbar to roll oh. with that Man, because that's not like his. No. First of all, he was in an airplane, so yeah. he, he does comedy. But that was kind of that it, so and that's all he had to do. Yeah, he was so iconic. Just that, that writing articles, very se serious. I agree. So, and that was the premise of you know of the episode was like he is a very serious. Yeah. And and then so I have no communication with Kareem leading up to it. It's like you know agents like like reach out. So I don't even know anything about like what his opinion on me is or anything. He comes to set and. Kareem is the type of guy that I think takes a little while to warm up and like so right away like I'm immediately thrust into the scene where like I'm kind of being like the most absurd comedy like asshole version of myself and his role in the scene is to like play it really straight and like act like he doesn't like what I'm saying and that's happening and I can't tell if he <laughs> finds it like truly the first scene I was like oh. this guy's gonna walk off the set and like quit because like he's offended but no and then by the end of it we got so close that he came to my house after we wrapped oh, like, that's right. Weeks later, brought me a gift, came over, hang out, sat on the couch, like hung out with me all afternoon just talking about life. And I was like, another surreal moment. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar sitting on my couch, like coming to Venice 
and like just like sitting and hanging and like he brought me gifts. He brought me like goggles that he used to wear. Like <laughs> what? Yeah, you had the goggles. Yeah, I have them in my house. Yeah, and uh, so. And he warmed up by the end, and he he's so funny. Especially because your character is actually, for the most part, until the final season, and really only sort of halfway through the final season, like the worst. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like the worst. Yeah. Like, I don't know who I'm rooting for sometimes. Like, yeah. I, I kind of, as, as Dave the character, I kind of want you to win, but at the same time, I'm like, oh my God, this guy. That's the, tr you know, it's a hard line to thread where it's like, you know, I have to in the show be more of an asshole than I am in real life like for the sake of plot and yeah, for yeah, conflict yeah, and yeah. whatnot but, and it's like but I always say like I don't want to become like an unlikable character like at the end of the day the show is called Boy, Dave and you want to did you walk the line I walk the line but you still kind of I hope root for my character to win which is like that's the right way to do it in my opinion like or I'm just going to be like well it comes back to the season finales yeah. you talked about which yeah. I want to talk about which is that you know just when I think like I really can't watch any more of this guy be rude to Gator and yeah. treat his fans like yeah. He's so lost and he just doesn't know what he has in his relationships. Oh my God, this guy's a car crash. Yeah. And then in the last season, uh, last episodes, I feel like you're like, oh, well, wait, come back because there might be a change. Absolutely. I feel like, you know, one thing I really, really pride myself in is the season finales of every season. Like, I really think like we have like the best season finales of any show ever. Like, I really feel that way every season. Like, they're, they're, they're so good that they could like end the series. You know what I mean? And like to get that level of catharsis is the word. Uh, I think you just have to like plot it out right. And it's like, it's not going to mean as much when I'm bringing Gator on stage at the VMAs if I'm not going through like turmoil leading up to it and like abandoning all my friends along the way. And it's like, it's all kind of mapped out intentionally. And I'm happy that everyone, you know, gives me the benefit of the doubt, my character at least, to stick with it. And I mean, it's the genius of the show and the writing, man, and the, and the performances is that you and, and the ensemble, and we're going to come back and talk about the, the, the other characters in the show who played an essential role in carrying that. It's a byproduct of the fact that you assembled the right people and told the right story that we did come back because yeah. if you got it just a little bit left or a little bit right it would be been all wrong yeah. you know what I mean yeah you've always just been authentically yeah. yourself yeah and I think that's what what draws everybody to you as you're trying to figure out your place in all of this yeah you don't ever divorce yourself from who you really are to get there which you know ever since I've come into especially hip hop it's like who is this comedy guy like is he like making fun of everything is he like culture vulturing you know but i think like the did anyone thing really honest question did anyone actually call you out and say look dude i'm not a really a fan of what you're trying to achieve and you had a dialogue with him trying to figure it out has anyone ever kind of questioned it to you oh ebro did it on the radio yeah. and he was just like i'm going to be honest it's because you're white and you're making jokes about it and yeah, you yeah. know and then i said to him i said i you know totally hear you but like let me ask does it ever feel like i'm not being myself and he said no it does not so i th to me it's like the ultimate thing you can do as an artist is like be like so pure in yourself with your intentions and if you're doing like to me i like the, how i ex like would imagine a culture vulture would be is like trying to act like something they're not and like right, totally right, like right, stealing right. a whole swag and style like when it's not even them but i feel like everything i do as a rapper really does come it's so unique no one else does anything like what I do and I think that and people respect it I think because I'm just being myself that's a perfect perfect interaction between two people who care very deeply about what they do I would expect Ebro to ask that question and, yeah. I, and I would expect you to give that answer it's yeah. kind of the perfect to and fro yeah. you, know, you know my theory is with it I think you took some of the principles you had by being good at basketball mm -hmm. into this world because yeah. that as someone that grew up playing basketball that's what happens like all of us be sitting there the white dude comes up yeah. and you're like alright but if you're genuinely yourself yeah. it's like oh okay Cool. Yeah. You can hoop. Let's yeah. go. We good. I, I, I agree. I, I do feel like the way I carry myself as a rapper is very similar to the way I carry myself on the court. And you and let's be very clear for anybody listening around the world right now who's unsure. Dave carries himself on the court very well. Yeah, yeah. Just Google Lil Dicky basketball. You'll see the footage. It's I, yeah. I'm not up here blowing smoke. It's I, I really am an elite basketball player. What was the best basketball game you ever played and who was on the court? Well, uh, I used to play pickup a lot with Kanye, like wow. back in 2017. Were well, you giving him wow. buckets? Yeah, I was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The first time I ever met Kanye, yeah. I, it was on the court, and it was a three-on-three full-court game. Oh, that's too much. That's, where that's where I was on Kanye. So oh. I, literally the first time I'm meeting him is me guarding him, and then I thought to myself, like, how do I play this? Like, I think Kanye, like from what I gather from all his music, would want me to go as hard as I possibly can. So that's what I did. And you know, Kanye's actually like he's got such an interesting game. I love the way he plays so good at like finishing around the rim in like this weird way. There was one moment where I, you know, the ball was going out of bounds and I saved it and threw it off him. You know what I mean? Oh <laughs> disrespect. And then and then everyone like was like, like what what's how is Kanye gonna react to this? And then he was like, Good save. He was like, What? It's a rapper thing. Like he said something like it's a rapper thing, and I remember thinking like, oh my god, like he sees me as a rapper, like kind, like I just what a moment of my life. Does he trash talk? Not well, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, yeah. Do you? Not to Kanye. <laughs> <laughs>
I, I like you know I let my game speak for itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, yeah. exactly. I mean, if you really can play, that's always the best. That's always the best yeah. way forward. Amongst the other people who have shown up, and it's important we talk about this because in a couple of weeks' time, he's going to take to the biggest and most important stage, probably in athletics and entertainment combined, which yeah. is Usher. Yeah. And that episode with Rick Ross and with Usher, you know, that Atlanta episode. Yeah. That's a very powerful and pretty funny, also intense episode. For sure. Yeah. I mean, first off, just know this: Usher was the first concert I ever went to as a human being. Wow. Yeah. So I'm seeing Usher for the first time. I'm like a 13 year old boy and like this man is putting on such a show all the women are like crying because they're like oh and i just thought like wow and like what a, i thought every concert would be that way no because <laughs> <Okay. laughs> not everybody's going to the super bowl no. No. and that's why i'm like so happy that he's getting this opportunity because like that man is the ultimate showman and like just to be with him on my set of my show and like to tell him these things in reality even in the show i say this to him and it's like another like i really i said this to you in between like this season season three was like every one of my like childhood dreams yeah. came true yeah you know who's us as a really great straight face comedian is Rick Ross. I've, I've always felt Dude, that. He's so funny. Rick Ross is unbelievable. Yeah. And like that man was so nice. I had never met him. And like I came in and like I had to go in. And I, again, like I don't know how familiar everyone is with like what we're going to be doing. Like I don't know how like if he got the script and like knows the. And so I go in like at lunch before he's about to get called just to like, you know, prep him a little bit. And he, I just go in there and he's sitting in there shirtless. <laughs> Sm smoking and it was like oh. out of a movie and he's like just looks so iconic everything I said to him about like what we were going to be doing he just looked at me and he just kept going too easy <laughs> <laughs> that, that was his response to everything too easy and then like the, 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 the episode was centered around his chain and like we got like a fake chain made and I was just like so worried that like he wouldn't want to wear it or it wasn't going to look right like you know what I mean and then he was like no just use my chain and then I was like, thank you. It's but like a like, million dollars around your neck. I was like, thank you, but like, we're going to have to use the chain in scenes that you're not even here for. And he was like, no, you can just hold it. <laughs> <laughs> so I literally, he would like leave and I would be holding this like hundreds of thousands of dollar chain and like using it in scenes. And then like, I'd give it to him the next day. It was like, what trust this man had for me. I wonder, you know, just to sort of finish that part of that, what's real, what's not. Is there any part of you that's trying to protect people in your life while you're trying to tell stories definitely like there are times where like if i have first off like you know one time i made a mistake of like using someone's real name just their first name and like my the, my friend was like dude like my mom just hit me up like you know it was like a story that like it was a funny story but maybe he wouldn't want publicly to be and i was like a real learning lesson for me and then even like when i change the name sometimes i like think to myself well i know x y or z is going to watch this and be like he's talking about me and then i like it's weird because i make a lot of like potentially insensitive material but i really am as a person very sensitive and like don't like i hate the thought of disappointing people and like hurting their feelings so so how do you get over that hump uh if if i if i i think if i did something that if i imagined someone watching it and it would crush them i wouldn't do it i, I would like deviate even if it's incredibly funny to you and those in the room i would just deviate enough to where i'd have the excuse to be like that's not necessarily about you right 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 you know right. which is denial really it kind of is denial but I would deviate, I would try, yeah, you know, if it's the best thing ever, it's tough. Like, that's the story, you know, I feel entitled to, like, draw from real inspirations. and. Well, here's the thing. Artists feel that, and because you're both, well, actually more than both, you, those three or four of the arts that you are rolled into what you do in terms of writing, directing, acting, make, making music. But, but just, you know, from a comparative point of view, from being a writer and an actor and a musician, musicians lean into the truth all the time. Yeah. The idea being, I know this may hurt you, but I need to say it. And we'll heal together if you can just, if you just let it, let it go and, and be, right? I feel like comedy gets to do that with a much harder edge because it's like, but it's funny. Yeah. You even say that in some of the lyrics on your album. You're like, that's a joke. Ha ha ha. Yeah, that's yeah, a yeah. joke. Ha ha ha. I'm just yeah. kidding. That's a joke. Yeah. I think oftentimes the trouble is less about when I do anything funny. The trouble is like, if I like really like, like try to have a serious moment that like is based on something that seriously happened to me. Oftentimes I try to use memories where like I am the victim or the brunt of the joke. But that being said, there are certain people who probably were the uh, quote unquote, I guess, oppressors or the, right. the, and I, even though they did wrong by me, I still feel bad because like, you're not doing it for revenge. No, I'm you're not. Doing I'm it really for not. Story. I'm right, doing right, it for a story, right. not for revenge. And then I also know people grow. Like there are things that I probably did where I picked on somebody. I'm sure when I was like a young person, I'd look back on it and be like, "Oh my god, what horrible behavior!" Like I've definitely bullied kids too, and I've but I've been bullied by in so many circumstances. Oh, that's the cycle. So where's the line for comedy for you? 
And I ask you from, uh, yeah. from from your point of view on comedy, because every comedian has a slightly different line here in terms of how far you're willing to go for the sake of a laugh. I really believe in the art of the joke. Like I believe that comedy is like a, a, like a holy art form. And I think a lot of comedy, the best comedy comes from the stuff that is straddling that line of like, should, should he have said that? Or, and like, that's the, that if you hit that sweet spot, that uncomfortability, that is like the prime time comedy. So like, I really like do you know, I would never, I, again, I try to be a sensitive person and think like, who is going to be offended by this? And like, is there merit to the, to them being offended? And is like, is this too far? Is this group of people that will be offended by this? Like, is it worth doing? Like, is am I being, in, and I think along the way I have matured and grown as a human being to where I am more sensitive than I would be back in the day when I was initially. Because like, you understand people a bit better the older you get. But the further you go through this life, you understand what really resonates with people, both positive and, you know, hurtful. And I think I happen to be like, you know, putting comedy and content out like at this like intersection of like social media accountability that like, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you could make a joke. No one cared. Now you make a joke that's a little uncomfortable. And people are going to call you out about it. And you like you really can like see people's opinions more. So I just think that has heightened awareness of people to like even think about what they're saying. I think before comedians might not even think about it. They're just, fuck it, it's funny. Now I think everyone's thinking, like, well, how is this going to, like, you know, be perceived? And I think that ultimately can be a damning thing, but I think it's also a good thing. And yeah, it's like there's also growth in that, isn't it? Growth there? in that. It's like, you know, at a certain point, like if there are like marginalized groups in this world, like sometimes it's better not to make a joke about them in this moment. You know what I mean? Like there's just like ways to go about things. And I think the more society is enlightened, the better we'll be. That being said, uh, you know, uh, there are like there's we have to let people be people, too, and like make mistakes and like let people. It's a frontline art form. I mean, look, you can say that about anybody who puts themselves out into the world in order to try to entertain people. But I feel like comedy, if you want to put it in a hi in a hierarchy of who's really at the front lines of this march forward in terms of the entertainment business, comedy is like over the trenches, man. You know, Not to do a bad analogy, but it's true. It's like you are going in and getting bloodied and bruised as you're trying to entertain people because it is that thing that walks the line at all times. And it pushes you forward as a as a writer, as a, as a comedian, you know what I mean? Like, to not work blue immediately, to not just be, like, derogatory right out of the gate. I mean, I think it challenges you as a, as an artist to be yeah. like, what can you do to be a little smarter? To, to be smarter, right? But you look at somebody like Nate Bergatze, right? He's selling out arenas and stadiums doing, like, uh, material about his water heater at home and his sneakers, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, you don't necessarily need, and there is a time and a place for to go blue and go be offensive, but then you can get away with anything as long as it's funny. Well, I think I think the people who um, the, the comedians who who really um, have this unavoidable collision course with their community and their fans and the public are the ones that don't get fulfilled talking about their water heater. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's like no disrespect to that because yeah. we need that. It's the ones who wake up like the only way that I resonate with myself. Mm -hmm. In the same way musicians can only tell their truth to be authentic yeah. is if I walk this line, I don't have any other way. It's like they're built to do that. I, I hear that. and There is something, you know, thrilling about walking that line. And uh, yeah, I think a lot of... The, the, we have such a... Like the whole history of comedy, I feel like, is made of like the best people that walk the line the best are going to be the most successful. And like it's almost always been like those are the best comedians, like are people that make kind of relatively controversial statements. I mean, people and, talk about Bill Hicks like he's one of the greatest all-time icons and heroes, but at the time that guy went through a lot. I mean, mm -hmm. he was... You know, way ahead of the curve. People, way like, ahead, way of, ahead of the curve. People didn't really even understand what he was talking about. Because well, sometimes it didn't even feel like comedy. No, it wasn't. He was, <laughs> you know? he was like, he was freestyling. Basically, you know, yeah. Bill Hicks was defined largely by basically giving a college lecture about like how we all are. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, um, shouts to Gator. Oh my God, shouts to Gator. I mean, talk about one of the most well loved sidekicks in comedy history. I, think, I agree. You know? Yeah, for sure. Like, uh, and I knew that was going to be the case, like because I was on tour with this man for like years. How did you meet him? Uh, I so I was like just about to begin rapping, like, do, doing shows. I should say, like by the way, like I had like a whole like fan base and community of people that like wanted to see me live, but I'd never even rapped in front of anybody in my life before. Like it was like the digital era where I'm able to like put all this stuff on YouTube and then like pe like I'm too scared to do karaoke. Yeah, yeah. So I'm about yeah. to start doing concerts and like back then especially I would like try to like prove how like dynamic of a rapper I am by like jamming all these words in and like making these long ass verses. And I was like rehearsing and I was like, man, I need breaths. Like I, I and like, I don't want to play my, like, just song. Like, I don't like when rappers just play their song and rap over the song. Like, I wanted to open up the verse and really rap. And I was like, I need a hype man. And my manager at the time, he managed Tyga and back in the day. And he was like, well, this guy Gata was Tyga's hype man. Like, maybe you'll meet him and you'll like him. So literally Gata came to this office that I was recording at. He, he, he 
it's the ultimate gator thing that he did. He literally came with like three other people, a videographer, like an intern, none of which he like even knew, like he barely knew these people. He just brought, <laughs> he brought them with him to look like more, prof- like cooler and like more professional. And like it worked, we hit it off immediately. And then all of a sudden I'm on tour with him. And it was just like, I remember being like on the road all the time and being like, my life is like a movie right now. This is like the stuff that's happening with me and Gata is so funny. And I would just religiously write everything down. And then, you know, it's just never ending material. And then I knew when we made the show. Now I always knew he would be like an incredible comedic yeah, personality. He's funny. What yeah, I didn't funny. know is like you could put him in the like most important emotional moments and he was able to like turn on like To be a honest with you, he was, he was the first emotionally resonant character in the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was the one who showed yeah. where the show actually, where the heart of the show was. I agree. Before that, I felt like, okay, this is an extension of little Dickies yeah. and jokes. Yep. Then it was like, wait, there's some real depth going on now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, for sure. All credit to Gaeta. And he was, you know, a lot of the stuff that we put out in the show, like the more emotional things for his character are things that he's experienced in real life. So simply like, I give all credit to him to like be that vulnerable to like tell his, and I, I've seen it like firsthand. I've been out with him. People be like, man, like that bipolar episode, like, yeah. like it changed, like it like changed the way me and my family talk about like my bipolar disorder. I mean, I'm actually getting a little bit emotional just going back to that, 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 that episode because his, it was such a tough scene for him to carry. Yes. And he did it in such an incredibly human way. Yeah. Like. No. And a- another like risk in the sense that like I was like, we wrote that scene hoping it would be very emotionally. But like I knew Gator was able to be like make all the funny little slick comments and like at, but like I didn't know how he would be in that situation. And then I saw it and like literally he was like crying and then they say cut and then he turns and looks at the camera and he's like, that's what the you call acting. <laughs> it's, like, it's like so cool. And he just killed it. Yeah, he killed it. Yeah. And also, just at the beginning, the way he introduced himself as a character with all of the bravado and all the confidence of someone who did not have their sh- together at all. Yeah. That's so human. Mm-hmm. Everybody at some point in their life does that, man, puts on that identity in the sense that like, oh yeah, I got you. I can figure this out. But on the inside, they're panicking. No, like this show, I think is so strong because like the two main characters like wear their vulnerabilities on their sleeves. I do it in my way, and the way he does it is even more vulnerable, and like he really kills it. How important was YG showing up to give the show the the, the boost it needed? Well, it's like like first off, I mean, it's very important to have like the entire pilot centered around a plot line yeah. about a particular rapper, and they show up, and they show up. <laughs> yeah. I have I have. There's been I'm not going to name names. There have been episodes on the show that are written for rappers, and they don't show up. Were they supposed to show up? Yeah, YG not only showed up, sh- sh- came early, stayed late, like the ultimate like dream guest, and like yes, it was very a legitimate like the pilot is like really season one is about a, a guy trying to get legitimacy so it's like the pilot i want to be like a little bit of in a total encapsulation of that premise what better way to do it than to have it be like the quest to get a feature verse from a rapper and you know yg is like ultimate legend like i love yg and i think he really killed it and yes getting him like you never know even today i'm like you never know this season was the first season i was like they're gonna they're gonna show up yeah but like season one and two i was like oh my god like the night before i mean when you did that scene yeah they would have been hearing it for the first time, right? Yeah, yeah. So it was nerve wracking in that. I'm like, oh my god, I have to like live, like perform like an acapella in front of YG now. And but you know, your back is so. T- I, I like don't even love doing things like that unless my back is to the wall yeah. and it's like survival mode. Yeah, like, that's yeah, the yeah. only way. Like I even want to rap. Like there are times where like people are like, just rap. Like and I'm like, no. I mean, there was a time in the '90s when it became so common for rappers to be asked to rap, like comedians are asked to tell jokes. Yeah. The rappers started to incorporate it into their verses. They start to be like, don't ask me to freestyle for you. Yeah, it's it not ain't free, man. It ain't free. Yeah. It ain't free. Yeah. There's so much um, about this series that we could keep talking about. And, and I'm so happy that we have the music now to coincide with the series because, you know, it's great hearing the songs. It's great hearing them in full. It's great getting each narrative broken down. It's kind of kind of it's quite a reflective experience, actually. It makes me want to go back and watch the whole thing again. So I hope that was the plan. Yeah, that was the plan. It's like I, I, I kind of and, and, and I designed it to be a thing that was like, yeah, really satisfying to a viewer of the show. But I also tried to like create like a total track list and sequencing order that like if you had never seen this show and you're just like, who is this little dicky guy? Like. I wanted it to be like a, kind of like a, a, a real album experience. No, it's very clever yeah. because, you know, for instance, where Harrison's Ave sits in relation to everything is in relation to the timeline of the show, but it works when you listen to it. It's almost, it's almost like a rap opera, mate. Yeah, and there's like a proper intro, a proper outro. It's like it really is designed that way. So I'm, I'm happy that I'm able to like make this thing that's like serving multiple purposes at once. Um, the Macklemore show was hilarious. Um, he was brilliant the way he came out and kind of even mocked his own sort of sense of enthusiasm and yeah. exuberance, which I thought was great. Um, but there's one thing that I think that was a nice way for us to put a ribbon on 
on this our latest conversation, which is to talk about how this show has kind of affected your, your, your perception of relationships and how people relate to you. Yeah. Because so much about Dave is about your inability to be able to really hold on to love, the fact that you know you struggle with your own identity, and therefore it makes you very difficult to be loved and to love. Yeah. And I mean, first off, my favorite part of the show is the writer's room and that process, because it's really like me sitting down and like like opening up in such a way to like 10 incredibly funny, smart people who are like able to like dissect what I'm saying and be like, well, you know, maybe you feel that way. Because and like there are times like I didn't like there's a, an episode. Uh, there's an episode, I think, in season two, season one, sorry, where like I like. You know, I have these positive memories of overnight camp and, and I, I thought everyone just like thought I was the funny guy. And then I like realized in the episode that I was being bullied. And I truly that exact experience happened in the writer's room where I was like, well, I know that they, they I was just being funny. And they were like, I don't know, man. <laughs> and like and, and I love my camp friends and like I don't like I, I it was more nuanced than that. But like there is like I'm just able to discover and what we do well, is we, we can only work with the material we have, even friends. So if you are not sure about your role in all of this and you end up putting yourself out in front with a joke or two. Yeah. And I find you funny. Am I laughing with you or at you? I'm just reacting to what you're doing. Yeah. And back then it didn't matter. It was like it didn't I, matter. I just wanted to I don't know. I'm bullying you. I'm just laughing at you. Exactly. Totally. And, and, and that, you're right. There's that side of it, too. But yes, what we try to do is like find like little kernels of like magic massive truths that are like, you know, like I am inherently a selfish person. Am I catastrophically selfish the way I am in the show? No, but it's like, we take the truths of like, what, why I am selfish? Like, well, maybe you have your whole, like I'm on this, like, you know, very self-fulfilling prophecy where like nothing matters in life, but like reaching the certain stepping stones of my career. And, you know, as a result that, that is a dangerous way to live. Have I alienated my friends in real life the way I do in my show? No, but like, could I have, like, if I didn't have the exact right head on my shoulders, maybe. And, you know, it's, 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 it is cathartic. And I just feel like I, it's almost like journaling, you know what I mean? The show for me. And I do learn a lot about, and there are lessons that I, my character has learned in the show that I know are the lessons that I need to learn in real life. It's in like, it's in there, Dave Bird, because yeah. I think this is, the, this is an important moment for wherever you decide to go next, which yeah. is like, okay. I don't know if you're in a relationship right now. Oh, yeah. I'm fully in love. Found the one. We're live together. We're getting married. Amazing. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. That's incredible. I love I, I met the best girl in the world. What's her name? Kristen. Congratulations. Thank man. you. Yeah. That's beautiful. You got to meet her. Could you have got there if you hadn't got to the show with the same success? I would hope, but I think, you know... Maybe today. Let's people, qualify that today. People always said, like, you know, love isn't about, like, being swept off your... My parents, when I say people, like, my mom would be like, love is not about... Like, you have this whole false narrative of what love is, where you're going to meet a girl, and she's going to blow you away right away, and you're going to... It's going to be a fairy tale. She's like, it's not that. It's it's the right person at the right time of your life. And I kind of always blew her off, but there is truth to that. Like, I did meet Kristen right when, like, my show started. Like, I had, like my dream my whole life was to make this show, and... I felt like I couldn't let anything get in the way of like, you know, self-actualizing and doing that. And then I met her right after I like turned that corner and then I met her right before COVID. And then we like got to like spend the whole year together. And like, really like before then, I'm not sure I was giving relationships a fair sh shot. Like it was like, you know, I would go on a lot of dates, but I don't think I would give people, but like for, it came at such the right time. And she really is the absolute perfect soulmate for me that I, I kind of, my mom might've been right about like timing is everything. It's beautiful, man. Yeah. It's good to see you. Great to see you. I love, I love all you guys. <laughs> I love that yeah. we landed here and then we can pick up where we do. I have so many questions. I want to know. I mean, I suppose I suppose I could ask you quickly, you're going to direct a film now? Like what's, what's Oh, happening? yeah. I'm totally like I'm currently writing uh, my first feature film that I want to write, star and direct. And to, yeah, I, you know, as much as I, I, I love the show, Dave, and I always will. And I love making music, but it's really like I, I, I'm 10 years into it. And I feel like I'm just at the beginning of like all the things I'm capable of doing. So I'm really excited about the future. Yeah, you are. Dave Bird, everybody. Yeah. Thank you, guys.